Well, welcome everyone to HydroTerra's latest webinar. Today, we've got one of our favorite presenters, Phil Mulvey, back again. Thanks, Phil. And Phil is going to be talking to us about understanding landfill leachate, further developments of the L to N ratio after almost 30 years of use. Before we get into that, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon people of the Kulin Nation where we are located today. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So Phil's founder and director of innovation at Environmental and Earth Sciences, or EASY as it's known these days, um, and Phil's a true expert in landfills. A little bit about Phil. So he's been investigating, managing, designing, closing, building on and auditing landfills since 1981. He designed the first bioreactor landfill in Australia for Wagga Wagga Council in 1992. He has published numerous papers on different aspects of landfill management since 1986. In 1996, at the third National Waste Conference, together with Stuart Brisbane, he presented a paper introducing the L to N ratio, now known as the Mulvey ratio. In 1997, he revised the ratio at the ISWA conference. What does ISWA stand for, Phil? International Solar Waste Association. Thank you. In Wellington, New Zealand, to the version now used. Since then, the l to n ratio has been adopted widely as a managed management tool for land for leachate. Phil has qualifications in soil science and hydrogeology and is an auditor in New South Wales, South Australia, and Victoria. All right, before we let Phil charge into things, we love your questions. And uh, in order for you to raise them, please use the Q&A button at the top of your screen. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? Well, we actually enjoy them. It's a good way to keep in touch with people like Phil. Um, we get to share knowledge, facilitate some education and provide a forum for industry leaders. Sorry about that. Um, before we do that, just a little note about our groundwater sampling course that we've got on at the moment. It's really gathering momentum. We're doing this in conjunction with ALGA. So if you're into landfills, you're probably into groundwater sampling. So we do have this industry accredited groundwater sampling training underway. So feel free to get in touch about that. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Phil. Thanks for that fantastic introduction, um, Richard. And I really want to acknowledge your team for the great work they do in, in putting these seminars on and ensuring that the industry has a chance to hear from a whole variety of different people um, in regard to measurement and landscape. So um, thanks and well done to your team. And thanks for the invite for me. Next slide, Richard. Briefly, we're just in talking about landfill leachate, we do have to have a, a bit of a discussion about landfill types. The landfill chemistry, both in how gas and leachate is, is derived. Um, why the L to N ratio was set up. Um, what is the new tools for assisting in the L to N ratio and um, the closure of the session? Um, you've heard my experience. I don't need to talk about that greatly, um, but just of note, the first paper I did in 1986 was with Roger Parker, um, who many, many of you will know quite well. And we did one of the first papers of, probably the first paper on understanding a bit about landfill leachate uh, in Australia with reference to the Burswood Casino, which is built on a landfill. Um, 
the original stage one casino. Next slide, please. Landfill types and impact on waste chemistry. So it's a, important to understand a little bit about um, what happens with petressable matter as it breaks down and then to understand a little bit about landfill types. So well, this session will just concentrate a little bit on understanding the different phases of the landfill. So the first stage is the aerobic stage where oxygen is still present and dominates. Um, and there could be a slight drop in pH associated with that. Um, the next stage is the fermentation stage. This is the beer brewing stage where you get a, a lot of CO2 um, produced, but no methane and you get the consumption of nitrate. The next stage um, is anaerobic living off sulfate and uh, girthite, so uh, rust within the landfill. That's why landfills that are deeply into the methogenic stage actually have a lot of black covering of iron, which is actually uh, pyrite precipitated where the rust used to be. So they're the basic stages of a, of a landfill. In some degrees, they're also basic stages of, of organic plume contamination moving through groundwater. Need to understand that organic matter is made up of, of a certain ratio um, of carbon, nitrogen, phosphate, sulfate, and potassium. Um, and the cells actually need that. Um, the microbes need that to break down. So they will plenty of excess carbon, so they'll release that. There's plenty of nitrogen, they'll release that. They keep phosphate cycling around because they need that. So you don't often see elevated phosphate associated with landfill leachate. The sulfur they need, um, or it gets precipitated as pyrite. So the phosphate and sulfur are held within the landfill typically, and the potassium and nitrogen species are released um, mostly, uh, well, particularly in the case of nitrogen, um, to groundwater and potassium entirely to groundwater. So the really weird thing about it is that potassium, because, it, well, next slide, please, Richard. I suppose I better stop talking and just move along a bit in the slides and stay in order. Um, so the thing to understand about petressable landfills, and um, in New South Wales, petressable are defined as municipal waste, whereas elsewhere in Australia, petressable is any organic waste, um, is hydrocarb is that really not much comes out of them in, in, except they're very nutrient rich. So hydrocarbons get broken down within the landfill, particularly the aerobic stage, and then into the anaerobic stage. pHs and tars are also broken down. Heavy metals are immobilized by the sulfur in, in versions of, of pyrite or sorbent of the six we oxides, which is your rusts, which cover your, your iron during the aerobic stage. Your PCBs and your pest, in pesticides um, tend to greatly um, stick pretty much to the organic matter and the clay within landfills. Um, chlorinateds are a problem, um, though they degrade in anaerobic or faculty of anaerobic conditions. The types of conditions in landfills can result, and this is why it's highlighted, um, in vinyl chloride. So that's one of the exceptions to what comes out. And as we'll see later, there'll be a bit of a discussion on what on earth does PFAS do. So landfill leachate looks pretty nasty, really, but it's in terms of hazardous compounds, the greatest hazard is eutrophication and absence of, of oxygen. So you can see a lot of bubbling going on there. So there's, um, this is a landfill leachate collection pond. And what you've got is lots of blue-green algae and lots of bubbling effects of CO2 and methane coming from it. Next slide, please. So the factors that are affecting landfill types and thereby their leachate is the age of the landfill. Um, the input into the landfill and the cover. And they're very important to consider because they have different aspects on how the L to N ratio may behave. Next slide, please. So you look at an age of landfill, I've been around long enough to see these phases. So it is important to understand what happened. So pre-1979, the landfills were burnt. And I grew up at Mudgee, a small town in Western New South Wales. And I used to love going to, to the landfill as an eight to nine year old, collect all the, uh, all the old pram wheels to make billy carts out of. 
and the fires were always going at the landfill. So it was unsightly and located out of town because it was burnt. Um, it didn't have ibis then, but it certainly had rats. Um, so it meant that the pre-1979 landfills have a lot of burnt material, not much patrescibles. So lots of metals and PRHs are in them. So you get a different style of leachate. The 1979 to the mid-1990s landfills were known as sanitary landfills. They used clay liners. Um, they had a lot of patrescibles in them. They weren't burnt. Um, they were often gully landfills, and we'll come back to some of the problems associated with those. Um, in the post-mid-1990s, there was a movement to entombment of waste with gas extraction. Still had lots of patrescibles, um, but the circumstance is that they're now contained within HDPE liners, um, both top and bottom. Um, lots of redevelopments occurred on the sanitary landfills uh, predating the 1990s and the burnt landfills. Whether we'll have development over the internal landfills is an interesting question. So increasingly around the world now, there's a movement away from entombment to, to controlled um, uh, leachate interaction with the environment, which we won't get time to discuss today. But part of the problem with internal landfills is not a set and forget, as, as people thought when they were designed originally. Next slide, please. So what's the input material? Um, so defining a number of different landfill types. So you've got a municipal landfill that takes municipal waste, so that, that street collected rubbish waste. You have a huge amount of patrescibles in it. You have plastics. You can have all kinds of things. You can have a lot of PFAS waste streams, um, not just fire extinguishers, but Teflon, um, all the food boxes from pizzas, um, the microwave popcorn, the disposed carpets, with with uh, Scotch Guard on them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, solid waste with patrescible, which which means you've got um, tree waste, cardboard, timber um, coming in together with dirt. So they have significant amounts of patrescible. Then you've got soil only, which has small amounts of patrescible, but not a lot. And then you have special monocells um, that might have ash, might have different types of specialised waste. Um, we had a monocell on a landfill area that just had um, uh, laminated wood and MDF. Um, and so, yes, not all monocells don't produce patrescibles. You've got to look at what the monocell does contain. Next slide, please. Um, it's also important to understand the nature about cover a little bit. The cover's if it's permeable, you get gas and water diffusion in and out. And if you've got a good grass cover, um, the methane is actually biodegraded to CO2, except where macroporosity is. And then you have impermeable covers to which you pull um, the gas off. The nature of the cover does, to some extent, affect the leachate and the water, and the level of the water does, affect, does also affect the leachate as well. Quite a few landfills, just before moving on, I just want to touch on another issue. Sorry, Richard, just another few seconds, please. Um, <laughs> part of um, cover design and, and landfill construction is often leachate is reticulated. Um, the TDS does go up, but intriguingly, the TDS seems to bottom out somewhere between five and 8,000. It doesn't go any higher. And we think that that's to do with some of the geochemistry and, and microbial reactions involved. Now, next slide. Thanks, Richard. Um, leachate plume chemistry. So this is, we looked at this slide before. Richard said, do I, do I want duplication? Well, in actual fact, I do, because it's important to understand that this material um, will be very reactive. Um, and though it comes in different phases, it will react with the environment as it moves through it. And it is a major problem because it causes eutrophication of our, our streams, though um, macrophytes love it. So you often find on some of the quite older landfills, lots of grass growth that is stripping out the nutrients. In a, and that's why phyto caps are now uh, much more designed for landfill closure. However, it doesn't address the PFAS problem. Next slide, please. So you can see here is a, an old um, paleo channel and it 
what you see is that, that green little oxbow, it's a former oxbow um, lake of probably some 30,000 to 2 million years ago. Um, and it, it comes in under that centre fence, so it's dipping away underneath. Um, the landfill's built over it, and you can see the methane has migrated vertically up from that lens and killed the trees. So it's the only thing that's killed it is the absence of oxygen. Not Methane is not, for trees, dire directly toxic. It's the absence of oxygen that's killed it. But you can see where the leachate's expressed to the surface as this lens um, slopes sort of 90 degrees away and expresses the surface. But you've got large amounts of grass um, to the fence. And then in the farmer's paddock beyond, even though it's in the middle of a, of a drought, you've actually got a green pick there uh, for the animals. So the grass can tolerate um, much um, gr a more aggressive methane rising because the oxygen's penetrating down the 30 or 40 centimetres and the microbes are converting um, that methane to CO2 at the level at which oxygen's coming down. Trees having deeper roots and a greater dem demand aren't able to actually knock, um, uh, get the oxygen penetrate more than 30 to 40 centimetres and so can't knock the impact of that methane. So you can see that the, the, nutri the, the leachate itself is nutrient rich for the plants, which as long as they don't get hit by methane, they quite like it. Next slide, please. So this is um, from Roger and, uh, and our paper um, together with the client um, back in 1986. And it was one of the first look at what happens with landfills. So what happens is um, the dotted line on the left represents a landfill greater than 10 metres deep and of significant age beyond more 10 years. So you're already a fair way up the concentration in leachate of any particular substance you're coming through. The key thing to note is it has what's called a chi-square distribution, which means it rises reasonably rapidly to a maximum and then has a long tail off. Most of the primary settlement occurs at that point of hitting the maxima, associated with the degradation of the organic matter within the landfill. Um, and if you're looking at that as simply as methane or CO2 or even as leachate itself, typically it hits um, that maximum between five to uh, 20 years if the landfill's less than 10 metres deep. If it's more than 10 metres deep, you need, you need to push it out more considerably. Next slide, please. So let's get in, into the nuts, the bolts of what we're talking about. Here's the phases of a landfill you go through. So you have the aerobic phase where you have aer aerobic bacteria breaking, da breaking down what's available. Um, they need oxygen to do it. They consume the oxygen. You move to the next stage, which is the start of fermentation. So phase two is or, or the first part of anaerobic phase, which is a fermentative phase, which doesn't produce methane. It produces CO2. Um, you get some, some ARCHA and a little bit of um, anaerobic bacteria producing hydrogen during this. Um, then you move to the transitional um, phase to the, to the full methogenic phase. And that stage, you, you hit peak CO2, but you start to have methane coming in. And then finally, um, you go into the maximum um, methane phase, which takes a period of time. You're moving more into, into secondary settlement, not primary settlement. And then you come out the back end where you start to get oxygen penetration again. So that's a long time frame. That, that anaerobic phase, that phase four, it is in the realms of 30 to 40 years, depending on thickness, it can be longer. And it does vary on cells. So cells can go through their own phases at different, different speeds to other cells, or pockets can be faster or slower, depending on the amount of, of clay and soil co-deposited. Co so you can get quite a degree of leachate variation within the landfill itself. Next slide, please. So this is sort of how and this is um, for a spill, but it's a good slide to show that the redox zones associated within um, an organic phase moving out, but in this case, it's it's 
um, the organic reactor itself, but you still have those so same phases. So you've got an oxygen dominated zone, um, and a nitrate dominated zone, manganese iron. So manganese and iron go into solution, sulfate gets taken out of solution, and finally methogenesis. Next slide, please. So just revisiting that again, what you've got is you've got different reactions occurring um, with the uh, medium through which it travels. And the very first part, the, the front of the front, is where the native cations are displaced and they go up. We'll talk a bit more about native cations later. But also at, at the nitrate attenuation stage there, you start to see ammonium coming in, but you start to see bicarbonate come up, which is the reaction of the micros producing CO2. And at pHs 5 to 8, CO2 will express as bicarbonate. And then you move into why you end up with manganese in solution and why you get iron in solution and finally sulfate dropping out of solution. Next slide, please. Do you want to just clarify to people why we're moving through these phases? So, um, certainly, oh, Richard. Um, the reason why we move through these phases is this is why the L to N ratio is used, and it and it reflects some of the chemistry because the TDS and pH and EC to some extent become poor indicators as they change to different things. Um, so, understanding the site conceptual model of the phases of the leachate, including how it reacts with the environment. So we'll talk a little bit later about absorption and illite and what illite does in terms of the uh, L to N ratio. So it's important to understand that um, a landfill leachate reactor or a landfill reactor is producing leachate that is like a time-dependent plume from a uh, hydrocarbon spill, but all the reactions occurring at the one spot and moving out as a plume um, ahead uh, with a series of phases that you can actually monitor. And each of those phases have different issues that might be associated with the environment. And do you get different bacterial populations emerging as you move into this sort of oxygen depleted environment? Most definitely. Um, when you're in the aerobic, you have the aerobic heterotrophs. You will also have your, um, within the landfill itself, you'll have your alkane degraders and your naphthalene or pH degraders, and they're aerobic bacteria. Um, so they will work in that sector. Um, then you've got your denitrifying bacteria, um, and it changes again to, so if you've got, for instance, um, you move from the oxidative phase, the reducing phase on iron, you'll have thiobacillus present. Um, so not thiobacillus, you'll have desulfur vibrio present and desulfur vibrio um, does a reverse reaction. It takes sulfate and breaks it down and liberates energy um, to other bacteria, uh, the heterotrophs, to be able to feed the desulfur vibrio. So you end up with a circumstance of um, you're releasing um, CO2 and CO2 will be released to the, to the uh, methogenesis, um, which will use the CO2 to strip it and take energy off and produce methane. So you've got a series of microbial um, processes that, that you go through where you're dealing with complex organisms living together. So by the time you get to methogenesis, you're actually at what we call swamp gas. So you're producing the natural swamp degradation process or the process that makes, which you'd be familiar with, um, the black shales. So the, the marine muds um, tolerate a higher salinity, but they also have the same things they ha have within them, um, desulfur vibrio um, and the same uh, interactions with the anaerobic heterotrophs and the, and the, the methogenic bacteria um, to create this community that, that moves energy around for the benefit of all. All right, thanks for the clarification. Um, so let's just go back to the biological breakdown of plant materials. So Richard was a slide too soon really, but um, so you've got the microbes that, that um, want to break down to 
get energy, but also to get the nutrients they need. So, so salinity goes up in some instances. It does depend on your background salinity. So down here in Melbourne, for instance, um, if you have a landfill that's on the Silurian, so the, the Humevale siltstones or um, the mudstones, um, you have an issue where the local groundwater is actually quite a bit more salty than what the landfill's producing. Um, and same with on estuary sediments or up in Sydney on the Wanamata Shales or Larambine Shales, you, you end up with a circumstance where the surrounding water is, is actually saltier than the landfill. And in those instances, it's very hard to pick out when, whether a front is passing or not. And that's why um, having ratios explains all that. Um, biological breakdown of all plant material, not just what's in the landfill, produces this, as does you'll produce and be in colour. In leachate, it'll be brown to um, brown green. There'll be gas discharges. It'll be elevated BOD, biological oxygen demand, because of the tannins and the, the phenols that are released by the plants and the terpenes. Um, so it's not just landfills that does this. It's mulch leachate. It's decaying litter in the soil. It's night soil, which used to be used around the edges of old landfills. And night soil is the dunny can collector, which phased out in the late 1960s in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, but any um, manure um, will also produce it. And that's why manures go to anaerobic digesters from large dairies, as well as municipal waste. So you need to be aware that what other sources might be around that could cause this. But the key thing to understand is that elevide, potassium and nitrogen species are rare in groundwater, particularly together, as both microbes and plants do what they can to sorb them up quickly. Now, there's some exceptions. The paleo waters in inland Australia will be rich in nitrate, not ammonium, because the acacias and the casuarinas during the wetter period of 200,000 years ago actually um, laid down nitrate. So most of our inland waters are nitrate rich, but potassium poor. Um, so you can still, the elder end ratio will pick that up. Um, next slide, please. So just before we do, so under, you know, things like dairy effluent, like in New Zealand, you get those big nitrate or nitrogen plumes. So if you wanted to get the bacterial side of things up and humming to deal with that, you'd be adding more potassium to get that ratio right, would you? So, well, you, yes, you can pick it because in those systems, particularly in the Canary Plains, um, they're low in potassium, so you can actually see it. You want to get it humming again. You, you Sometimes um, you'd not put a bioreactor before the river and use the bioreactor to... Um, nitrify what comes through where you actually do a denitrify nitrify process because you've got to convert it to ammonium first um and so their problem is a nitrate discharge as is europe um right across europe they have a major nitrate plume problems um so you, you've got to create set up a bioreactor area and you actually run that nitrate plume through a through a bit of peat with um uh, some appetite um, or, right, or crushed rock phosphate, so you're not releasing phosphate to the water, but you're making phosphate available to the microbes. So a combination of peat and phosphate would be your bioreactor um, to uh, destroy that nitrate or reduce it to nitrogen gas, but it's got to go to ammonium first. So um, there is a process by which you have to do that. Um, and it's hard to do at scale because you need a longitudinal bioreactor running all the way beside the river. Um, one of these was installed in the Coburn Sound area associated with the fertiliser problems in Western Australia. Um, all right, maybe we're going to get the slides. Getting slightly off topic, my fault. Um, so exchange under clays. So. Clays are charged particles, and I won't go into all the aspects of clay chemistry, but they have a net uh, negative charge across them. Um, Sesquioxides oxides are a little bit different to clays, but um, they what's called a pH-dependent charge. 
and they also have a net negative charge uh, on some of their surfaces. So the charge is actually met from the water through the cations from the weathering of rock. Um, and those cations compete for the charge and the preference is decided by the charge density of the cation, which is the valency divided by the hydronic ion radius. So effectively, aluminium is more preferred than calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium down that order. And ammonium will sit up ahead of calcium depending on a little bit on the colloid chemistry. Um, and ammonium is, is particularly preferred with zeolites um, and, and certain biochars and various other things. Um, but the thing to note is you do have to understand a little bit about your, your background geology. Um, so the, um, um, the, the, the Hume siltstones, for instance, and many of the meta, meta sediments going all the way up um, from Victoria into New South Wales, the Silurian sediments, they have a lot of illite in them, or they have a illite smectite, which has a preferential for sorbing potassium. Um, but biotitic granite in the highlands of of um, Australia, northern Victoria and southern New South Wales, um, releases potassium. So it's one of the few instances where you'll get slightly elevated potassium in groundwater. So understanding your geology is also important. Next slide, please, Rich. The hydrated ionic radius. So what, what exactly is that? I cut all those slides out, Richard, but uh, all right. Um, what you're dealing with is, for instance, sodium doesn't have a particularly huge um, ionic radius, but it, it attaches water. So it's able to have a lot of water molecules surrounding it, but calcium has less water molecules. So sodium's capacity is to keep attaching water molecules to itself. So it's got a charge of one and a very large water molecule based ionic radius. So next to lithium, it's the least preferred both lithium and sodium stack so many waters on each other, they disperse clay, they push clay apart. Um, magnesium has a small tendency to add a bit of water onto itself. Um, calcium, not so. Iron, and so calcium's got a two plus valency. Uh, and so that controls um, the, the charge density. I'm sorry, I've actually got that ratio right. So you, you're appropriate to raise it. it. Should be hydrated ionic radius divided by the valency. So my apologies. So well spotted, Richard. Um, so then it goes all the way up to your, your three charged ions in solution. So your, your three valencies, such as aluminium, um, with a three plus charge is quite preferred. But when it's ALOH4, it's only a single plus valency, and it's an, and when aluminium is in solution at very high pH, um, but it has much larger hy hy hydrated ionic radius, so it tends not to be necessarily um, well preferred on ex ion exchange positions. So that sort of explains the basis of that. I don't have actually time to go into all chemistry no, at all. Quite right, quite right. We'll move on. Thanks. Um, so this is the original Dunmore data that came from the paper and. Unfortunately, we actually used um, something the young people would not know about is overhead projectors back then. So this was a shot from a, uh, a plastic overhead, which you put onto a screen that projected onto the wall. So the data is not a very good quality, but the thing just to note is you potentially might have one or two breakthrough fronts occurring here, but, but it's into a, a uh, recent sand um, mine, so it's backfilled in a sand mine. There's no liners. It's sort of a, a 50 system that occurred. Um, and you can see a substantive breakthrough front starting to occur in about 1995, um, where your BOD goes up, the fermentative phase, your, your bicarbonate goes up, so you're producing masses of CO2. Um, your sulfate starts to drop in that, that top, um, image. So it displays all the classic plume behavior. So I'm not actually making this up. This is not a load of, of textbook bullion. This is actually what happens. Um, 
notice the TDS is bouncing all over the place. So it's not particularly a useful indicator here. And the pH goes down in the acidic phase, as you can see, and then comes back up again. But it also goes down other times. And were, were they fronts coming through or, or were they just dilution events due to heavy rainfall and, and evaporative events? Or were they um, due to other factors? Um, but just before the front goes up, um, you can see the sort of steady period. Um, you can see the TDS for some reasons dropped and then up it goes. Uh, and then you've, you've got um, as the nitrate, am I tracking nitrate there? No, I'm not, I'm just tracking ammonium. So you can see that's why we thought, oh, this useful, you know, we had 20, well, at that stage we had, you know, four or five years of monitoring. That site we monitored for in excess of 20 years. So we, we continue to get very good data from that particular site. Next slide, please. So out of it came the opportunity to do some plume behavior modeling. So the first paper talked about ammonium plus potassium divided by calcium plus magnesium plus sodium. So it was what was in leachate divided what, what is the common native cations. Potassium can be native, but it's normally sapped up by um, trees pretty quick. So you tend not to get it, except in those circumstances we spoke about before. The ratio didn't also pick up the aerobic phase that well, so we added uh, nitrate in the paper in 1997. Why multiply by 100? And I've been asked that question quite a few times. The human brain doesn't handle 0 0.001 through to um, 0 0.01 very well. So if you multiply by 100, you now have a number that falls between 1 and 100, and the brain handles that much better than 0 0.001 to 0 0.01. Um, so that was the reason for multiplying by 100. No other reason except to make it visually comprehensible to the reader. Next slide, please. Just before you do, so what are the units you're using there on those? It's, it's unitless. So it's milli. What do they call it? Uh, it what? doesn't matter if it's if it's in this instance we use we're using milligrams because we're just lazy and don't want to convert. Um, but it, it wouldn't matter because what you're looking at is relative difference, which we'll come to in a sec. Mostly it's universally adopted um, in the mass balance, not the charge balance. Okay. And we didn't need to it on mass. So now we go to the bottom line and just look at the L to N ratio, which is there shown on, on the bottom right um, next to ammonium. So you can see that the L to N ratio kicked off before ammonium did. Um, it's got, it, it had a little downturn as did ammonium. So was that due to out competition by the native cations being released as ammonium got absorbed? Well, I, I suspect so. Um, then it goes up um, and as you can see, the ammonium has a dip as it moves from the fermentation um, stage to the uh, methogenic stage, but the L to N ratio um, just continues to climb. It doesn't reflect that um, in change in rate. Um, the pH goes up. Um, the TDS is sort of comes, you know, bounces all over the place. So it's not telling you anything greatly in this environment. Um, but the L to N ratio is showing, it's predicting that the front at very low concentrations of breakthrough and is consistent in predicting its behavior. Um, as you can see that the BOD goes up at much the same time and comes down. The sulfate starts to come down from that point of time. Um, you can actually see the sulfate recovering again after hitting zero. So this is a fast plume breakthrough because it's in sand and, and it's poorly capped and poorly lined. Next slide, please. So let's talk about um, my poor spelling with Y-T-E-H. But anyway, um, let's talk about some uh, recent developments on it. And um, let's not talk about my poor editing. Um, this is a landfill uh, that's been infilled from the bottom upwards. Um, borehole 15, which is right where Richard's cursor is. We must have practiced this. 
um, is an indication of um, um, where the last lot of filling is. And there's two adjoining properties there. Um, one's oh, three or four adjoining properties. Um, you can see there's a few fruit trees around. Those scattered trees are fruit trees. Um, there's a bit of gardening um, and there's some chooks which you won't be able to see. And there's, there's GB, the background bores are GB05, GB06, and, or 3, 6, and 7 on, on the two different properties. So let's go down to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to have to get rid of Richard's image so I can see this properly. Transmit <laughs> Richard. Um, so the one property is borehole five. Um, it's got an L to N ratio of one. Um, it shows low phosphate. It shows um, low ammonium. It's an aerated system and low nitrate. It's got a little bit of bicarbonate in the water. It's got a classic situation of having um, potassium lower than calcium magnesium. Surprisingly enough, it's magnesium. Well, it's a sodium magnesium dominated. So in terms of ideal growth, we'd probably want a bit more calcium in the system. Um, but if you look across to it, um, you can, the fluoride's also low. So that's a, a, a brief run of quick understanding of the L to N ratio, how it looks at that and saying it's got a ratio of one. Well, next door has gone up to two. And you go, okay, there's a problem there. Let's have a look. Okay, there's quite a bit of ammonium. There's a slight increase in nitrate. But the phosphates come up. Um, bicarbonates come up. Um, potassium appears to have come up. Um, but because we've got phosphate up um, and the overall TDS appears to have dropped a little bit based on what we, we've measured there simply because there's some out competition in bicarbonate, we're actually doing with a system where they've added fertilizers. They're doing a lot to get their garden and lawn to grow. Um, they're not putting town supply water in because the fluoride's not up. Um, so that ratio doesn't reflect, and they may even be using septic, septic tank um, disposal. Um, so that doesn't reflect landfill travelling up gradient. Um, it's simply reflecting the site usage. Now, if you go to borehole 15, this shows all the classic indicators. It's actually either in the edge of the landfill um, right in it or on the very, very edge of it. So what you're seeing is a breakthrough flood occurring. You're going through the last stages of fermentation where you're producing nitrate. Your sulfate is still there, but being consumed. You've got a bit of phosphate balancing around in the system. There's no fluoride to indicate town water. Um, ammonium is high and going up. Sulfate's going down. And sure enough, the L to N ratio is going up, uh, reflecting the fact that we are uh, producing, we're still in active methogenesis phase and we're producing a lot. It could be a front that's passing or the very edge of the landfill itself and just reading. So you'd have to go back to logs to confirm that. It's either reading a front or reading the decay of a cell because over that three year period, you start to see the L to N ratio drop. Um, the bicarbonate is still up, which indicates CO2 is still quite rich. Um, the ammonium is starting to drop and the potassium may have peaked. Um, so nice, lovely, classic data set showing what's happening with the L to N ratio. What the ratio means, is irrelevant in terms of the number, it's its behavior that counts. So does the LM ratio apply to creek water? Let's have a look at this example. Next slide, please, Richard. So here we have quite a bouncy L to N ratio. It's, um, it's certainly above one. It's above two and it's getting to, you know, getting above five. But if you run your eye across, there's no ammonium. Potassium, actual fact, is can be high when it's low comparatively, but potassium is just really, really low. The overall TDS is low. Um, sulfate is unusually high, so it's 
in an urban area um, because it's not an old water, it's, it's, it's a young water. I should have put fluoride up so we'd have another look of fluoride and TDS. Um, but you can see nitrate is periodically very high. So the LDN ratio can be used in ground in surface water scenarios, but you've got to use it with great caution. And you, potassium doesn't not normally express to rivers, and ammonium is rapidly converted to nitrate in the river system anyway, um, particularly an aerated system. Uh, and you'll find lots of plants, macrophytes, your um, your juncus and your um, 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 bulrushes and so on growing on the banks in the area that the discharge occurs. So in this instance, the LDN ratio is telling you absolutely nothing. Um, and that's why you need to look at, if you're going to use it surface water, um, you've got to have a pretty good idea what the water's doing. So what's your, the LDN ratio, as I'll show you later, is a key to look further into the data. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some interpretation aids. So when I said later, I meant the very next slide. Um, so here we plot the LVN ratio on semi-log paper with time. And you're dealing definitely, immediately we, we see a couple of um, significant things. Um, the ratio is variable across the monitoring wells. This is monitoring wells associated with a landfill. Um, you've clearly got one, there's undoubtedly leachate of some sort, but you've got another one that's bounced along from may or may not be leachate to suddenly going very, very high. And the first conclusion would be it is leachate. So let's go and have a look at it. Next slide, Richard. So we're dealing with two bores here, bore 6, which is... Um, on the southwest next to borehole four with a um, orange notation. And you can see that the landfill's the whole area in the middle and borehole six is not supposed to be directly in the landfill. It is beside a road, in a dip in the road. So i just give you that little indication. Borehole 10 is also beside the road in the dip of the road. And it's either in or potentially in um, landfill so we'd have to check the logs for that so i'm just going with the data we have it in front of us at the moment um and the groundwater appears to be um up gradients in this direction moving through the landfill which is all that bit between 10 and 6 and discharging out so if you go to the next slide please so you run your eye let's run our eye along 10 first we can see ammonium bounces a bit but it's high and could be falling sulfate comes in and disappears completely and then maybe starting to come back bicarbonates um is dropping off in the in the back half of the monitoring period in 2018 um and phosphate is close to zero and, and fluoride is low let's look at six so ammonium we run our idea on ammonium and it's you know, 73, 38, 41, 52, 14, jumps to 626, 475, 182. So let's look at nitrate. So nitrate is low, but then jumps a bit um, and then jumps even more, then drops back to low and then jumps again. If you run your eye down at phosphate, you'll see that phosphate was low and suddenly went ridiculously high. And the fluoride bounces a lot. So we asked the landfill a few questions. They put a mulch out in the landfill and across the, the face of the landfill. They'd fertilized the mulch and they'd sprayed it with town water. So in actual fact, then we looked closely at the well construction and wasn't one of our wells, I have to add. It was slotted to the, just below the surface, half a metre from the surface. And it was in a culvert and so the water that ran down the culvert runs into the well at certain conditions. And so that doesn't actually represent landfill leachate. It represents poor well construction 
and a series of site activities on the surface. Um, so it's quite intriguing just seeing what you know what the data tells you when you look at it in more detail. And the sulfate ex expresses that, that there's aerobic, as does the nitrate, there's aerobic water occasionally entering the system, but there's also some highly reduced water going on as well. So sometimes what the data, the LDN ratio tells you is go and have a bit of a look before you automatically conclude it is actually landfill leachate. It's certainly patricipal leachate signature, not a doubt about that. The loading of phosphate indicates that it's got fertilization as well. And the intermittent high fluorides are indicative of irrigation by town water, all of which was confirmed with the client and the site inspection. Next slide, please. When you've got a trend like that, and, and you're liaising with the operator of the site. If it's trending down the L2N ratio, do you sort of say, well, we're heading in the right direction, do nothing? Or how do you okay. context? A lot, a lot of these are, are audit data, so they're not necessarily, I was the consultant giving the advice, but um, it depends if you're directly monitoring leachate or if you're monitoring a plume. So if you're monitoring leachate in a cell, you can say the cell's aging. Um, and that's good. It's what well, we're expecting to see that, but you'll start to see more a bit more settlement going on and so forth. If you're manage, monitoring a plume and the plume front passes, and you can say, well, this is the plume from your oldest cell. We may see other and just because it's dropping doesn't mean we won't be seeing other plumes passing. So it's good it's dropping. Um, how close are we to a sensitive um, receptor, a waterway, um, decides whether you do an intervention or not, um, and whether you have within your management system an attenuation zone depends on that as well. So the advice depends on, on the type of landfill obviously your license, the type of landfill, and the proximity to the sensitive receptor. Right. And let's just look at further interpretation aids for the LDN ratio. And this is not just plotting semi-log, but this can help you in multiple interpretations. So here's a series of different aged sand, uh, backfilled sand mines. They were backfilled with builder's rubble, which obviously includes patricible matter. Um, it's quite an old landfill. It's over in WA. It's in Sands, of course. Um, the site is as defined, so we couldn't get an upgradient well very readily because we couldn't drill off site. Um, but we got some pretty, and it's so long ago that, that that was our original logo. It was back when we had an office in WA. But anyway, it's very interesting data. So next slide, please. Nice logo too. Yeah, I like the old logo, but anyway, times move on. Um, so what you've got is a series of um, wells drilled into uh, different wastes, um, sometimes not fully within the waste. So when you're slotting across zones, it's always a problem. Um, and in an environment like this with sand and backfill with sandy waste, it's often hard to work out when you're drilling, whether you've drilled out or not. Um, so that it's across the Guildford formation. So a sandy clay down into, into a clay to sandy clay zone. So it's it's, it's a fairly low, low flow area. Next slide, please. So, We've split it up according to different classes and also done the L to N ratio. So you've got background where the ratio is a little bit higher, potentially. We've got impacted background that um, is resulting in a drop in the L to N ratio. And then we've got a series of different landfills with different behavior in the L to N ratio. Now we want to split that out a bit further and try and get a better understanding of it. So what we came up with, next slide, please. In this case, we didn't 
use it with nitrate, which we should have, but anyway. So we plotted against the LUN ratio against PE plus pH. And we've done this a number of times since. I'll give you some number of examples. So this um, allows you to split the behavior of the ratio according to the redox conditions. Um, so you've got a series of classes and you can see that they, they cluster and they fall out into quite separate um, domains. I'll now preempt Richard's question and explain what PE is. Next slide, please. So PE is the negative log of electron activity. So effectively, it's EH, it should be lowercase h, um, measured by your ORP um, probe, which I'm sure you can buy from Hydroterra or rent from Hydroterra if you don't have one already. Um, and you calibrate with quinhydrone on a, um, and it operates off a platinum electrode. So it produces a reading in millivolts. That reading, whether positive or negative, if divided by 59.2, is equivalent to the negative log of electron activity. So you're adding the negative log of ele electron activity together with pH, the negative log of hydrogen activity. So that defines, those two terms define the ion pairs and the nature of the redox state of the plume. And that's why by plotting L to N to it, you, you split aspects of the plume that might have same L to N ratios, but different redox. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is another example. Um, it's a site that is a former gully fill site. You can see there is two leachate wells, LBO2 and LBO3 close together. You can see there's the berm across um, the gully and there's two wells that are, and it's a very, very steep gully, and there's two wells sort of mid-slope down the gully, but sort of somewhat between cross-gradient and up-gradient. Um, you can't, I can't see it on my screen. You might be able to see it on yours, but Beneath SGO5 in that region there is horse yards. So you, you've got a source of manure sitting upgraded of KMBO1 and KMBO5. It's on um, a potential illite or illite smectite um, siltstone. Next slide, please. And this is quite interesting when you plot it out. Um, LBO3, which is the square boxes, um, is much more clay. Um, it has an interface drainage issue, so it gets water in it from up above when it's wet, going down to lower when it's dry, uh, going down to a lower level, I, I mean. Um, and it's also in quite heavy clay with, with less petrescibles. LBO2, the, the cross, is in quite petrescible environment and less clay, which you'll get in, in landfills. That Sometimes there's a lot more soil that comes in, particularly in country landfills, and mixed matter than there is in, in municipal matter. The municipal matter might only arrive two or three days a week, um, for the garbage trucks, and there might be a constant stream of, uh, of soil and, and um, commercial rubbish. The interesting thing is that during the dry years, the ratio is lower than during the wet years. And the reason is that during the dry years, the base of the landfill is the base of the gully, and it's the one that's wettest the most. So therefore, it's been subject for the longest period of time. And so therefore it's been subject for prolonged degradation. So it stands to reason that the lower component will be more degraded than the upper component, which also makes sense. It also makes sense that the wells with um, less clay and more petrescible matter, matter would be um, higher in the oil to end ratio. Note that because the 
fairly close in the similar system, their approximate position in redox, the PE plus pH, is much the same. But the background water is highly variable in redox. And on this scale, it's, it's not possible to pick a, a variation on, on the L to N ratio. So there's something going on with the background water in terms of its redox behavior. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk now a bit about PFAS. There's some fantastic work done by Nick Simmons when he was with the Vic EPA in Victoria. So that's Victorian data only. And then there's work done by Gallon across all of Australia on PFAS in landfill leachate. I've ordered them in ratio according to Nick's works. So as you can see, P for hex A um, is the dominant species in, in landfills as a mean across um, Victoria and, and also across Australia. So they've got quite good data matching, really. Um, the PFOA, for those of you who don't know, has been recently declared a category one carcinogen. Um, at the international level, um, WHO. So um, how long that um, becomes before the criteria drops in Australia to reflect that will be interesting. Uh, it's the second most dominant. Um, then you've got PFOS, which is the one people are most concerned about, is, is the fifth most dominant in um, Australian data and in the Victorian data. So let's look at LBO2 and LBO3. So we've already heard that LBO3 is in a heavy clay environment with some interaction from interface drainage above. LBO2 is a much more patressable environment. So LBO2 is not dissimilar. It's got a bit more PFOS, but same concentration really. I mean, it's got a lot, lot less of P for hex A, but the, the rest is comparably the same. Um, ratio. In this instance, PFOS is the third most common of, of the PFASs that occur most commonly in landfills. LBO3 PFOS indicates a substantive source from a, a, another potential area not associated with typical landfill waste. So you need to be aware that, that the ratios will vary from the means and you just need to have, have a bit of a look at it. Um, so that gives you some idea that um, you know, that, that level of PFOS is above criteria. Um, the level of P for hex A and PFOS together in the means would be above criteria if it was discharged into a waterway. And exactly what's going to happen with PFOA criteria, it'll be very interesting to see. But at this point, they're okay with criteria, um, except drinking water criteria, of course. Uh, next slide. So just looking again um, at where LBO2 and LBO3 is, but then again, look at KMBO5. So it's sitting um, down and slightly cross gradient. If all the, you, the hydraulic control here, as you can see, is controlled by the gully. So the water will discharge basically straight into the gully and then along the base of the gully and out of the landfill into the, to the stream. The stream sits at an RL of close to 330. So you can see over a very short distance, you've got um, almost a, a 30 metre to um, 40 metre difference in elevation over a short distance. So it is very steep there. Next slide, please. Now, this is from Borehole 5, MBO5 on site. And I haven't retitled it. My apologies. I only knocked this in a few minutes ago um, because it's really in itself very interesting data. Um, so what you've got is that this particular data, because of the saline background and the landfill leachate being less saline, um, you're seeing responses to landfill leachate and background imposing here. Um, so we have a very, very low sum, sum of all PFAS to start with. Those units are milligrams. So we're dealing with 0.03 um, micrograms of sum to PFAS in August 17. Um, the, the data consistency is not so good on PFAS. It's only 
just more recently started to be measured quite consistently. The LDN ratio is 1.44. In September 20, there's a series of data with LDN, LDN ratio 1.4. If for some reason PFAS wasn't done then, so it was done the following round in April 2020, that's after the heavy rains had started. So it would be nice to have actually had the back end of, um, so April 2020 was the heavy rains and September, so it was before the heavy rains, it was the drought. By September, the drought had broken. So it'd be nice to have had what the impact of the L2N ratio was by the water pushing through the system and the breakage of the drought. So the data we have for PFAS is not consistent then with the L2N ratio and the other data. So it's this stage showing that it's, it's 0.089 as a, a total sum of PFAS and starting to come up. In November 21, the LDN ratio is 1.6, and the sum to PFAS is 0. Uh, 000, so it's 0. 0.59 of a part per billion. So it's actually come up. The really intriguing thing is, as though nitrate um, has bounced a bit, the LDN ratio has come up, so now other things have gone down, but potassium hasn't greatly moved. And this is because it is this problem we talked about is the system is sorbing um, potassium from the landfill. I don't have other data to actually see what's going on here. It's just an indicator, but it's got some so strong conclusions forming that at the very start of the L to N, the very start of breakthrough, you will see PFAS. So let's, that's sort of the run of the talk. Let's just go to the conclusions. Oh, so this factor. Um, so all the things I just talked about, this site probably has an eolite or interstratified mineral, eolite smectite. The eolite preferentially sorbs both potassium and ammonium. Um, we can only conclude that, that, that if the LDN ratio becomes elevated, then PFAS will also be elevated. And at this point in time, we need a lot more data. And the PFAS data for l n is good, nice to see from a standard site rather than a site that, that has huge capacity to sorb um, both ammonium and potassium. Next slide, please. So in summary, I want to make the following point very strong. There's no single number indicative of leachate breakthrough. Um, you use the l n ratio to go, is breakthrough happening? And then you look at the greater data. So it has to be interpreted in regard to your conceptual site model. You can't ignore the fact that you need to run a conceptual site model. Breakthrough fronts and aging can be done with the L2N ratio. Gives you a good idea what's going on, what's happening, how it's happening. Um, and the age of landfills and, and landfill leachate can be expressed beautifully on the L2N ratio with the um, plotted against PE plus pH. There's no need to analyze other contaminants beyond the anionic balance that you do. Um, and if you want a few other indicators, you know, iron and manganese and so on, until the N L to N ratio defines a breakthrough front. So all the monitoring associated with pesticides, and pHs, and GPHs, is unnecessary, with the one exception. Um, and that's PFAS. Provisionally, if the L2N goes up from the landfill, you should be immediately analyzing PFAS um, because it's likely you've got a, a sum to PFAS breakthrough front occurring. And I haven't seen what the time is, Richard, but... Um, you're a little that's, over, Phil. But, that's uh, a, well, you keep interrupting, Richard. I mean, really, I'd be on time if it wasn't for you. It's very true, Phil. Um, so thanks very much for that. That was excellent. I think we'd better move straight to the questions. I think we've got some excellent early bird questions. And then we've got a few in the Q&A as well. So uh, question number one. Have you considered that continuous monitoring of parameters such as pH, EC and temperature, et cetera, and their trends may be a more timely and cost-effective way of identifying breakthrough of leachate? 
Well, as you heard me just discuss, is that um, EC is next to useless um, for monitoring trends for breakthrough. pH has some value, but it, but it, when you're in a more permeable system, it bounces all over the place. Um, temperature in the aquifer, less so. Temperature in terms of bleachate, yeah, I mean, it's got some benefit. pH and EH together are very useful. Um, and Richard, you'll be able to tell me if there, if there is stable EH probes out there at the moment. Um, I'm not certain there is, but there might be. And in which case, logging pH and EH is, is useful, but not as useful at this point of, of doing ionic balance analysis. Um, gross breakthrough in a low water aquifer in a sealed system, um, EC, Will, would be useful, yes. So once again, it comes back to this, knowing your site conceptual model and knowing what is or junct, uh, augmented support uh, to assist the the six month or quarterly or annual monitoring that you're doing. And in those instances, the probes could be used to do that, to support and look at when the breakthrough might have first happened um, as opposed to just having that that annual or quarterly monitoring. Thanks for that. Question number two. Consultants often refer to an L to N value of greater than 10 as being indicative of leachate impacts. I can't find a source for that. Yeah, well, nor can I, because I haven't actually <laughs> said <laughs> that. Um, nor has we ever published that. Um, the ratio is a relative ratio. Certainly over 10, it's very rare to have a groundwater that would show and some of the bi biotidic micas with heavy fertilizer application on paddocks might come up with an L to N ratio greater than 10. Um, so it's you know it's a fairly foregone conclusion that if you're over 10, you've got a, you've got a strong likely impact of petrescible breakdown. You can't necessarily say it's leachate. But you can actually read a breakthrough at one to two or one to even 1.4 starting to occur. And because we're looking at PFAS itself and PFAS is literally um, close to a million times more sensitive in, in um, detection limit than the L to N ratio, um, then you really need to you start considering not just what the ultimate breakthrough is, but, but what's happening early in the L to N itself. Okay. I think you might have answered this one in the talk, but can the L to N ratios be used to assess for potential leachate impacts in surface waters as well as groundwater? In limit, yeah, to a limited uh, aspect, yes, it can. Um, as long as you're interpreting the full you know, data set. So you'd use the L to N ratio in surface water as as a clue for a massive, a more massive event. So if you see it moving in terms of that logarithmic um, temporal based plot, then you go, gee, I need to actually have a look at everything else. And it could just be that nitrates come up substantively because um, uh, Upgradient has thrown a lot of fertil um, fertilizer into, you know, potassium nitrate into, into the river. Um, it could be due to um, a whole variety of other reasons you need to look at, keep an eye on. So in this instance, it doesn't um, uh, give you permission to not to consider the full data suite. It's just an aid. Yeah, I would have thought the mixing processes and you know how dynamic a surface water is, it'd be problematic. Well, that's why I said it, it will it'll pick up a massive event. So if you're seeing a change, you've likely got something serious going on that you need to check it with. But just walking along the banks, any presence of macrophytes and bulrushes in a concentrated spot, and they're not upgraded of that spot would make you think, oh, I've got a discharge point coming out from the landfill here. Yeah. Okay, number four, if we had a robust liner for the landfill, would we could minimise 
lead chain. Would that be easy? <laughs> oh, this is the philosophical discussion that um, we could waste a lot of time on. Um, all landfills should have a robust liner. Um, whether the liner is um, a, a clay-based liner or a composite, or whether it's um, uh, HDPE liner it is a question of different philosophy of approaches by the different EPAs. Um, I'm actually a strong believer in allowing the system to interact with the environment around it, but to allow it to interact at, at a rate slow enough the environment can adjust to address it, like we just talked about previously, having plants soak up the nutrient um, or having exchange occur so that the, the plume moves very slowly and is attenuated. Um, a liner, the problem with liners is people think that it would be um, retained within the landfill. It's estimated in the installation of landfill that the minimum number of punches you get is, is two per hectare. Um, and two per hectare into a sand-based system can have a huge leakage rate. Um, so the problem with thinking that you have a robust liner is you stop monitoring and you think that your landfill is sealed forever. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. What happens to liners over 50, 60, 100 years, we don't know in terms of HDPE liners. Uh, and that's the landfills of the 50s and 60s. We now have houses on. They're now being reused. Will the landfills of the 90s um, and 2000s that, that have plastic covers and gas extraction, um, will we be able to build on them in the future or have other uses for them? It's a really difficult question that hasn't been resolved and I'm of the opinion that the philosophy of controlled seepage is, is not a bad thing providing you've got the right environment to do it some EPAs will not accept that So Phil you said uh, you're in favour of some interaction between I guess the leachate and the environment Yes. In terms of irrigation of leachate and reuse of it for that purpose, what should be on that? Ignoring the PFAS problem for the moment, um, that used to be a common scenario, was you'd have your golf course on your old landfill and your new landfill was next door, and you'd take the ammonium-rich water and shand it with a bit of town water to drop the ammonium below 150 ppm, and you'd spray it out onto your golf course to, to, to reduce the use of fertilisers. Um, and that was a perfectly adequate use. Once your ammonium gets up past 150 and certainly 300, but um, you end up with with burning and scalding of sensitive plants, particularly some certain grasses such as cooch. Um, so in that instance, you know, you just got to control the level of salinity and the level of ammonium in the water. Um, so, yeah, horses for courses, um, but it is what it mostly produces is a salty fertiliser. Okay. How to minimise PFAS impact on landfill feedstock and surroundings? How to measure greenhouse gas emissions from decomposing waste? There's a fair bit in this one. There's a whole lot of models on that back question. There's a whole lot of people who make a a very good income out of doing that. And so they're probably better people to talk about that. So I'll leave that second component alone. The first component um, is that, yes, we do have to consider carefully of getting PFAS out of our um, entire supply chain. Um, so the phasing out of oh, Scotchgard disappeared. I don't think anyone will recall seeing Scotchgard at the moment. Um, Gore-Tex, no, I think, is no longer using PFAS um, in their products. Um, the uh, use of Teflon, I think, is reducing. They'll still come into landfills, but they don't normally have some of the, the, the worst PFAS compounds in them. The main problem is firefighting foam, and there's two sources of those. There's 
um, or three all up. There is the um, firefighting foam cylinders. So um, they're probably best not to get those in the landfill. So quite a few of those, you know, um, come in from domestic and industrial waste, the, the small one kilo ones up to the five or six kilo ones. Um, they come into landfill and they contain the foam. Um, the, the concrete from firefighting areas and other areas will have foam and pregnant on it or wash out of it in the landfill um, as conditions change. So it, it, receiving that feedstock into a domestic refuse situation may or may not be a good thing. Um, fire solids, because of the, fire, the use of firefighting practice foams throughout the catchment, um, wash often to the the sewage treatment works and the input of biosolids to certain landfills probably should not be considered. So stopping biosolids coming in until the biosolids are deemed as being PFOS, uh, uh, PFOS and uh, P for A and P for Hex. Uh, clear would probably be most appropriate. Um, so yeah, that's several ways of addressing it, Richard. Okay, I would have thought you'd better off to put it in the landfill rather than have it sitting around in the environment. But um... I think it needs to go to special landfills. So it's a matter of dis that's a matter of discussion with the landfill licensing authorities. Is you know is a particular landfill appropriate for that to go to? Um, you're quite right. Is that maybe there's enough biosolids that have PFAS in it, then it might be more appropriate to put it into a monocell um, or an HDPE leachate collection line system rather than an unlined system. Has PFAS been added to the biosolids reuse guidelines, Jim? Not yet. Uh, interesting. Okay. Um, is a good one. Has the reduction in food and green waste going into our landfills altered the leachate chemistry compared to 1990s refuse? Um, it's not enough reduct. I mean, the reduction in food and green waste going in um, is yet to fully come through. Um, the FOGO recycling is just gearing up to a great extent now. Um, you still got vast amounts of petrissable matter coming in with construction lumber, with you know, great stumps and, and garden waste um, that may not be suitable for composting and the like. So at this point, it's too early. It might be appropriate to look down the track. Um, if we reduce the amount going in and we don't entomb it, um, then we can come over and reuse it again more rapidly. So we certainly harvest the methane from it. And um, the methane harvesters, the guys who run a business in putting it into power, into power stations, um, actually don't like HDPE lighters. They much prefer oh, oh, caps. They don't like HDPE caps. They much prefer clay caps. Um, it's, much, it's much easier for them to handle a, a, a clay cap system and more efficiently get the methane out than the HDPE systems. Um, so it'd be quite interesting to see where this, what happens over the next, well, I won't be around to see what happens over the next 40 years um, with what our landfills do, but um, some in the audience might, and I, I hope it'll be interesting. Hopefully they keep using the L to N ratio, Phil. Um, next one. Reinjection of condensate into landfill cell versus treatment alongside leachate. Look, you just heard me talk about that a while ago. It's quite common to, um, more so overseas in Australia, to, to reinject into the face for dust control and, and so on. Um, as I said before, for some reason, it doesn't seem to go up in TDS higher than five to 8,000. It accelerates the rate of methane breakdown and potential, um, which is good for the methane operators are coming in over the top. Um, now, what other treatments you might do, uh, spraying onto the top of a closed landfill is also quite acceptable as long as you're conscious of the TDS, 
DDS and the amount of ammonium in it. Um, and then Are there many landfills where the closure conditions have allowed that. Not a lot. Um, you, EPAs are rightly conservative, but the data from the 80s is not being actually published or well presented to, to show that this was successfully done. Um, so, yeah, not a lot. But you do have to manage TDS and you have to manage ammonium, as I've previously stated. But there's the similar restrictions for sewer. So you've got to manage the ammonium and TDS levels for going to sewer anyway. And some of these treatments... Um, could be substantively expensive for the community where natural treatments might be more beneficial. I mean, wetland treatment as well is to run a longitudinal wetland um, around the base of the landfill, if it's landfill cell or, um, or off cell elsewhere um, before discharging through um, off site and having a whole series of um, of uh, macrophytes to actually polish it. So the, the increasing interest in, um, in in phytoclosure and phytocaps and phytotreatment of leachate is occurring at the moment. Are there any states in Australia where the L to N ratio has made it into the guidelines? Um, I'm, um, I have no idea, Richard. Um, I was actually quite surprised, I only found out about a year and a half ago or two years ago, that, that a lot of people use it, and, and it's called the Mulvey Ratio. So I knew, you know, our company uses it, and a lot of our ex-staff use it, but I was surprised it's had widespread use, um, and the EPA seemed quite comfortable with, with it and its understanding. I did present landfill leachate chemistry talk to the Vic EPA a few years ago that took I think four hours so I bored I bored them bored them silly I think um <laughs> but I I, uh, I really don't know um so I, I can't comment but but it is it appears it's now accepted practice for, for groundwater monitoring are there any situations where particular land for sites where the L to N ratio should not be used? Um, no. <laughs> um, okay. In low, in low salinity, um, it's useful, very useful, um, but the the TDS variances and EC variances aren't as useful as people think. In high salinity, it's almost essential. So we got high salinity backgrounds and you want to you want to pick small movements of ammonium, nitrate, potassium to see when breakthroughs first first occurring. Um, it's very hard to see it in in a high background and a high background. The ratioing off the complex ratio like this shows it up. Um. Question 10, current and possible roles of radioactive traces that already exist in landfill leachate? Yeah, this is tritium and cesium um, that you're mostly dealing with. We shouldn't have any other radioactive traces in there because they're not supposed to be um, um, low and mid-level radioactive waste. They're not supposed to be disposed into metropolitan landfills. But put all that aside... Um, what this question is asking is the atmospheric testing that occurred during the 1950s um, resulted in an increase in cesium-127 and an increase in the tritium, the radioactive water, um, to occur above backgrounds. Um, so any landfill leachate migration into groundwater that's older than the mid-1950s, you would be able to see cesium. Um, 127 elevation occur it's it's more expensive to do than um the uh ionic balance of which the l to n ratio is based on um and it would have limitations into quite a few landfills where you're dealing with um unconfined aquifers where the water is you know of the last 50 or last 70 years so 
it certainly has a has it's a major tool in groundwater monitoring, but in terms of landfills, it's um a limited in application and more expensive than ionic balance test. Okay. So just to clarify to everyone, that's atomic testing, the the exploding of the bombs that led to that. Oh uh, sorry. Yes. Atmospheric testing of, of atomic bombs, yeah. Number 11, can biochar make leachate that does escape less dangerous? Yes. Um, we use biochar in uh, bioreactors at different, at different points in time. What it can do is hold the nutrients long enough for the, the macrovites. So we tend to run a biochar permoreactive barrier um, with a uh, macrophytes on top or slightly down gradient of it. Um, if the ammonium levels are too high um, and we need to just hold it back and give the plants a bit of a go, you've got to choose your char appropriately. Um, ammonium, some, some chars uh, are not so good at absorbing ammonium. Quite a few are. Um, so, yeah, it's um, certainly a, a potential solution. Okay. Now we've got, um, we've just clicked past two o'clock. Uh, we've got nine more questions to go. Are you happy to stick around, Phil? Look, um, maybe just take the highlights, Richard. There's quite a few participants still there. Um, so I really shouldn't go past about quarter past two. Okay. Do you have any guidance on how new practices in pre-treading waste and adverse thing, and the adverse things we are finding, especially through the removal of metals from waste, reducing availability of iron and waste regarding different ways to the past with adverse effects, e.g. H2S production? Yeah, look, um, surprise, yeah. If you take the iron out, you can increase the H2S. Uh, somebody knows their geochemistry here. Um, there's enough iron in the formation and there's enough iron coming in with the clay. So when you use, you run a landfill and you put day cover over the top or you have interim cover. So the H2S would rise into the day cover or the interim cover and it would then... Um, uh, reduce the girthite that causes the, the red minerals of the soil colours. So the reds, orange, yellows are all due to oxidised iron minerals. So a reaction would occur between the H2S and the oxidised iron minerals in most instances. Um, H2S is not a problem um, in landfill gases that that questioner clearly knows currently. And by removing the iron, the question implies, could it be a problem in the future? As long as day cover is used and there's soil co-disposed with it, um, it's unlikely to be a, a problem as such. Um, the landfill or, or the gas meters themselves that we go and you know, typically the five and one meters do have H2S on it. Um, and you know, good operators should be just keeping an eye on the H2S as well. But I've never known H2S to occur from the existing landfills for the very aspect that the, the questioner uh, indicated was that there's, there's lots of iron in the landfills. All right. Um, next question is, thanks, Phil. You mentioned looking at fluoride as an indicator of influence from town water. From your experience, what is the range in concentration in town water? Typically, it's it's 0.8 to 1.5 um, to be effective on um, against um, gum disease and um, all those other problems that I got growing up mudgy without fluoride in it. Um, so, yeah, typically it, it's 0.8 to 1.2. It can be a little bit bit lower, but don't forget it's being mixed with what you're putting in. So it might express somewhere from 0.6 to 1. But normally, you know, fluoride in most aquifers is below 0.4. Okay, now Bobby Wang has got a question. Can the L to N ratio be applied to contaminant plumes from other sources? 
AGL maple and dissolved phase plumes associated with petroleum sites or nutrient plumes associated with wastewater treatment plants? It'll definitely pick up nutrient plumes, petrescible um, material put it elsewhere, such as mulch and compost. Um, the chemistry approach is the same, except the fact that um, petroleum plumes don't produce excess potassium. Um, and so typically in those environments, just having the site conceptual model and understanding that you know, sulfate will fall away and nitrate will convert to ammonium as, as the oxygen consumption occurs. So the peculiarity of um, degradation of petressable material is they produce the combined combination of high potassium and high nitrogenous um, uh, species. Um, so it, it makes a very peculiar uh, leachate plume that is, is not the same as um, hydrocarbon plumes, um, even though it'll produce some of the same redox reactions. Um, but it is the same for uh, other organic wastes such as mulches and compost. The manures will tend to have more phosphate in them. So you'll see a slightly higher phosphate associated with manures and night soil, but night soil dumps are just about all passed through the plume stage at this point in time. Okay, James Stewart from Always Carbon. A bit of a plug there, James. A great session. Thank you, Phil and Hydroterra. Curious if you could comment on what is best practice for treating leachate escapes when it occurs. EGF PFAS is detected. What is the best practice to do about it? Mm -hmm. um, this is an evolving science. It's an excellent question. We don't yet, I mean, the EPAs across Australia and particularly Victoria to their credit have funded um, a lot of investigation of um, PFAS and leachate to try and understand it. Um, the current understanding is, except in certain circumstances, the risk to the sewerage systems is low because I'm looking at putting leachate into sewer. Um, individually, you then got to access, uh, um, consider what is the um, risk to um, other receptors apart from pumping it to sewer. So that could be um, via groundwater to surface water or via groundwater to springs or via groundwater to, to swamps. Um, in that case, it's a bit more of a solute transport approach and to see what the concentration would be for the receiver. If you're using, and this is no different to phyto mining, if you are using plants um, to uptake the leachate, um, and you're using, um, I suppose, primary treatment would be the, the, the macrophytes before you move into secondary treatment and polishing. So if you're going to the macrophytes in, in the first bay and using that as your treatment strategy, um, the PFAS, unlike chloride solvents, which translocates through the plants and photo de decays at the leaf, do not photo decay and they do pass into the plant but get stored within the plant tissue. So you would potentially, if you're concentrating some of the more dangerous PFAS substances would harvest um, the plant and send it off to um, a number of, of thermal desorption dissolvers, which we have throughout Australia. And they would be pretty keen to get a certain amount of dried plant matter to mix in with their soil stock to put less energy into the system. Okay, just a few to go, about four or five, six in fact. Hong Vu, great talk, thanks. Have you tried to compare or complement the L to N ratio with isotope data? I think you might have answered that. I haven't directly answered it, but um, yes, I mean, that's a good research area. The problem I have is that I'm a practitioner <laughs> and uh, 
um, I'm, I'm fascinated by research components, but I can only do the research components off client-derived data. Um, and the clients are only going to spend what's necessary to spend. Teresa Klingelhofer, can the L to N ratio be used to demonstrate the end of an aftercare management period? And have you used it in that context? Good question. Yes, it can. You'd obviously derive a threshold on what the ratio is and, and how it behaves with time, or you'd use the the temporal based logarithmic scale to show a downward trend. Um, so yes, it definitely can. Um, I haven't heard it used on that basis um, because modern closures of the mega landfills are yet to, I mean, they've occurred. I mean, you've, you've got Tullamarine being a classic um, mega landfill, um, but they're not at the, the point where they're 30 to 40 years past their filling stage to the point where you can see that the, the leachate is, is decaying to a satisfactory safety point. So um, I, I'm not aware of any of the, of the mega landfills being at the point where this could be used, but there's no doubt it could be. Hey, is there other indicators that can be used for town water in areas where fluoride is not added, such as some um, LGAs in Queensland? I, well, you can on the basis that um, usually the water that you're putting on, irrigating on, will have its own signature. And you then look at some of the ratios of other cations to look at what is the mixing of, if they're putting a, quite a bit of water on, you'll see a signature come through that's different. The L to N ratio might be a little bit similar, a little bit lower, but the other, say that the um, fluoride to sulfate and calcium to magnesium ratio will be very, very different. Here's a good one for you, Phil. From Dana Windle, we love the L to N Mulvey ratio. There you go. Um, thanks, Dana. Okay, <laughs> next one, Mark Peterson. Thanks, Phil. The source of elevated tritium includes the waste itself, old exit signs, watches, etc. typically well above background or old ATM, atmospheric levels, e.g. Tazioli, A et al. Tritium as a tracer of leachate contamination in groundwater. I don't disagree. I apologise for not mentioning that. Um, I still default back to cost. Um, you can do an ionic balance. It varies from lab to lab, but anywhere from $35 to $50 to get a tritium analysis done is quite expensive. Well, Phil, we're through the questions. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for everyone who's stayed on. Still got many people here. Um, great to have you on again, Phil. Really appreciate it. No, it was actually, I'm glad you asked me to give this talk, Richard, because it was a good opportunity to revise and to communicate, and I need potentially to write it into the paper, to communicate to fellow professionals um, about further ways of utilising and interpreting and extending and improving the interpretation of the ratio. Um, and also um, just, you know, if people got PFAS to the ratio, it was going to be very, very interesting because the only site we've got it on is a site where it, it is complicated for lots of reasons um, that I didn't go into, but that makes it very hard to kind of work out what's happening. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciated this, Richard, because it, um, I, I was until a couple of years ago not aware of how much industry uses it. So to, to improve the ratio is, is, is for the benefit of the industry as a whole. So thank you. It also shows the value of a really long monitoring data set, I have to say. Yes, it does. Drew Marsh, to finish off, Phil says, that was fantastic. And Mark Peterson says, thanks for a very interesting presentation. So plenty of support there, Phil. So thanks very much. And we'll leave thanks, it. Thanks to the industry. All right. Thanks, Richard. It's all the viewers. Indeed.
Bye. Bye.